Well, congratulations on uh, finding a way here. You'll be able to tell your grandchildren how you managed to get here, despite the women. Poor creatures starting off at 11 o'clock on that long race. I'd much rather be here. <laughs> they say, don't they, that there's a silver lining to the cloud? And a good friend of mine uh, in the congregation I've, all, I've met this morning who's discovered a new parking place. Well, they are so rare, aren't they? So if you've discovered a new parking place, keep it to yourself. But um, that'll be ahead of the game for you. Uh, next week, I'd like to remind you, we have Peter Adam coming to take a series of three sermons on Sunday morning, and that'll be a real treat. Peter comes from Melbourne in Australia, and, uh, well, he'll tell you what he's going to preach on when he arrives, but uh, he has actually just arrived. A great welcome to him, and we look forward to him as our preacher this August. Well, for fairly obvious reasons, our theme for these two Sunday mornings that I've been given is the spiritual athlete. And our text, you will already have guessed from what Derek has read, Hebrews 12, 1 to 3. And I'm going to read it again. I'm reading from the NIV. There are very tiny differences between that and the Bible you have in your pew, the ESV. Uh, on balance, I think I slightly uh, uh, prefer the one that I have in the pulpit, but there are no real differences that will uh, discomfort you. So, we are now going to be the athletes, and we read Hebrews 12, 1 to 3. They're wonderful words, and I guess many Christians have learned them by heart to their own great benefit. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance or endurance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Well, I think the race here must be the marathon, so it's very suitable that as these poor creatures start off in a minute or two, we are able to relax here and think of a much more important race that the Lord has set before each one of us. It's always been very natural, I think, to compare life to athletic contests. And it seems that everyone was in it in the first century. For example, if you'd been walking along the street in any Hellenistic town in the first century, you would have heard sermons by preachers of moral philosophy. It seems extraordinary that, doesn't it? Because in our culture, anybody who speaks in the open air, people hurry past having turned up their coat collars, we're all rather embarrassed by it. In any case, I think we'd all say we haven't got time to stop. But in those days, people did have time to stop, and they were always listening and hoping for something new. So apparently, these preachers of philosophy felt it worthwhile to stand up in the street and preach their sermons. And the same thing would happen in the synagogue. They also used the pictures from the athletic contests of wrestling, boxing, running, and so on. So it's not surprising that we find these metaphors and similes in the New Testament. And as I said when I started last Sunday morning, for our two Sunday mornings, I've chosen two particularly brilliant examples. Last week, in case you were not here, and you might like to look it up later, we looked at 2 Timothy chapter 4, 6 to 8. We won't go back to that now. We made an effort to take our eyes off ourselves because those verses made us think of many pastors and preachers in prison today, just like Paul in his time, because they were preaching the gospel. And we didn't just think about them. I suggested at the end last Sunday that we might find time to pray for them. Now, we can't pray for everybody. I'm sure you've discovered that soon, how many missionaries ask us to pray for them, and sooner or later we have a pile of things 
and sometimes we give up because we can't do it all. So prune your prayer list and make sure that who you do pray, those you do pray for, you pray for regularly. And I made a suggestion, I don't know if it touched your heart, that you might find time to pray for prisoners of conscience, prisoners who are gospel preachers, in one particular country. The uh, country that I pray for is Iran, because so many pastors are in prison there. And perhaps the devil is particularly active in Iran today because there is Christian revival going on there, which is an astonishing thing, isn't it? Considering the government and the situation. But God is working. So then, settle down and turn, if you will, in your Bible to Hebrews 11. I want you very much to look at the text with me as I speak about it. Now, there's one special sentence that is in my mind for this morning. I felt that one sentence was enough for us. Our minds are so full of all sorts of things this week. And the sentence is this. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. There's a race marked out for you and for me. Let us run with perseverance. And there's one special word from that sentence that is in my mind this morning. We've got very limited liability this morning. We're looking at just one word, and that is the word perseverance, which I think I prefer to endurance. Endurance sounds rather like stoical gritting your teeth. I want us to be positive and persevere. And then there's one very special type of person that I've got in my mind this morning. One type of Christian believer. Let me tell you who they are. What I've had in mind as I've been preparing are the many hundreds who, when they were young people, joined us here at St. Helens in years past. Uh, many were new regenerate believers. Many were students. Many were young city men and women working here in the Square Mile. Many were young Christians looking for spiritual nourishment and for one, two, or three, or four years, they came here before they left, of course, for other parts. They found friends. They found encouragement. They found, perhaps, Bible teaching they'd not heard before. So what has happened to all these people who, in their weekdays or on Sundays, came here? Students, nurses, city types, all sorts. Today, probably, they're lawyers, traders, Dentists, homemakers, teachers, accountants, bankers, pastors, plumbers, musicians, missionaries, you name it. Butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers, as they say in the old saying. How have they found life as Christian believers since they left us? How are they finding the spiritual situation where they're living and working at the moment? What kind of spiritual teaching have they been able to find? What kind of fellowship? What kind of Christian work to do? I want to suggest to you that for some of them at least, who are in our thoughts and prayers this morning, they found a culture very, very similar to the culture into which the author of this book was writing. Uh, I made this uh, use this week of a very fine commentary in the World Bible commentary series written by William Lane, and he attempts at the beginning of his commentary to give us what he calls a partial profile of the group to which this letter was first written. Now that's surely worth knowing, the historical context into which this was sent. And I just copied out one sentence that he gives us, which I thought was very striking because you could bring the sentence from the first century right into the 21st century and into the places where many of these young people now, of course, older, are living and working today. Here's the quote. Wearied from the constant need to maintain their Christian stance in a social setting that is no longer simply unreceptive to their message and lifestyle, but has become increasingly hostile toward their presence, and they are thoroughly disheartened. Just underline two sentences. In a social setting which is no longer simply unreceptive, well, that's been so, hasn't it, for a generation or so, people don't want to hear. But then he goes on to say, but has become increasingly hostile toward the Christian lifestyle. 
Well, that's certainly going to be true in the future if it isn't already true where you live and work now. And I'm sure it's true for many of the young people who used to sit in these seats and what joyful days they were, I think, as I look back. And now they live where Christian truth and Christian ethics are held as something strange and weird and intolerable. So here's my question. What is required of those people who used to be with us and are now working and living in other places? What is required of them in such a time and what is, of course, required of us? And what will be required of you as you leave St. Helens and go and live in Timbuktu or wherever it is to raise your family? And, of course, in a word, you know the answer. It's been used already several times in our service. It's the word perseverance. Now, I'd like to begin with a great foundational Christian truth. You probably have heard of it. It's a quite quaint phrase in some, way, some, of the way, some ways, but it's a wonderful truth to hold on to throughout your life. This great Christian doctrine is called the perseverance of the saints. The saints, of course, being Christian people. What this truth affirms is clear, I think, if I read one or two Bible verses that are familiar to you. So let me read you three verses which tell you what the perseverance of the saints means in practice. Philippians 1, 6. He who began a good work in you will carry it to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. He who began a work in you will complete it. Jude 24, a wonderful doxology. Surely you'll remember this. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and, without joy, and with great joy. To him who is able to keep you. And best of all, John 10, a promise from the Good Shepherd. My sheep listen to my voice, they follow me. I give them eternal life. And they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. What majestic words and what comforting words. I first learned this great and grand truth from a chorus sung at a script union camp. They're going on at the moment, of course, and many of you know about them, and I hope are praying for them, and the young people are hearing the good news at these camps. What a wonderful opportunity it gives. And I won't say that the choruses we sang were particularly brilliant uh, poetry, uh, just as good as some today, however. And this one went like this. Kept by the power of God, kept by the power of God, day by day, come what may, kept by the power of God. Well, what an assurance for anybody at a camp and also for a pastor in prison. Yes, thank God he keeps his own people. Thank God we can say this morning with certainty that nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. But the Bible also teaches that as Christian believers we have a responsibility to keep ourselves. God keeps us, but our responsibility is to keep ourselves. And we shall know who God's people are when we recognize Christians around us who are taking the trouble to keep themselves in the love of God. What was happening when the author to this book or letter or sermon, it's been called all three, sat down to write what he calls a word of exhortation? And my word, it is a word of exhortation. Again and again he says, let us do this, let us do that. Well, I will tell you what was going on. Take your Bible, will you, in your hand. Chapter 2, verse 1. And if your friend is still in the Old Testament, just gently help them, will you, into Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1. And if you've nodded off the same. And if you're dreaming about women on the marathon, forget it. Stupid people. There are better things to do in life than running marathons. Chapter 2, verse 1. 
We must pay more careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. So, apparently, there were Christians drifting. Chapter 3, verse 12. Turn over a page, if you will. Chapter 3, verse 12. See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. Drifting, turning away. Now turn to chapter 10, verse 35, if you will. It seems to be getting worse. Chapter 10, verse 35. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you've done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. And of course, there's a gold medal for every Christian. There's not just one who wins the prize. For in just a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one will live by faith. And if he shrinks back, I will not be pleased with him. But you're not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who believe and are saved. Certain people were drifting away. Certain people were turning away. It seems worse. I don't know if that's right. There seems a development. And then certain people were throwing it all away or thinking about it. Drifting, turning away, throwing it away. 20, 30 years on from the time you sat here, chucking it away. And if you lived as a Christian for any length of time, you will have seen all three, for sure. You will have seen Christians whom you know drifting, you will have seen the believers turning away, and you, alas, will probably have seen somebody who threw it all away into the trash can. I'm making my way, it's heavy weather, I can tell you, through 2 Timothy, the last half. You know, you get so weary, don't you, of the next king comes and he does evil in the sight of the Lord. They never, never seem to learn. And then on Thursday, I think it was, I arrived at the wonderful chapter of Joash, the little boy who's hidden away. He was the heir apparent, he was the true king hidden away until he was six or seven and then brought out and crowned as king when a very evil woman was reigning. And it's such a lovely story of God recovering the situation and Joash as a young man doing what was good in the sight of the Lord and restoring the temple and so on. And then your hopes are dashed. Jehoiada, the priest who taught this little boy all the way, and made him, at first, a great king, Jehoiada dies. And, oh dear, Joash goes back to evil, and in the end is assassinated. It's just such an anticlimax. It's just such a disappointment. And on Friday morning, I thought, I can't read any more of Two Kings. I'm absolutely desperate with every king that comes and its failure at the end. So it happened in Old Testament times, and it happens in New Testament times. Though there are heroes, of course, in Hebrews 11. We haven't had any time to look at them this morning, but they're worth looking at because they didn't give up. So what does Hebrews say? What does the word of God say? That is, what is God saying to us this morning? He's saying you are responsible for keeping yourself. Every believer has that responsibility. And therefore, in, in Hebrews, there are thousands of let us do this and let us do that. Look at chapter 10, for example. We shan't be able to look at them in detail, but it gives you some idea of what this writer feels and the sort of people he's writing for who are growing weary. Chapter 10, 22. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith. Verse 23. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. Yes, he is. 25a, let us not give up meeting together as some in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another. I think your ESV leaves out the second, let us, 
but uh, it doesn't matter. It's the same meaning. Let us do this. Let us do that. Let's draw near to God. Let's hold firm our faith. Let us not give up meeting together. Let's encourage one another. When did you last encourage another Christian to keep going? Well, we can't spend time on all those, of course. But we can concentrate on running the race that's set before us according to Hebrews 12, 1 to 3. Now, I want you to treat these little verses like a coach. I'm intrigued. Uh, I suppose you've been able to see something of the Olympics. I uh, haven't seen a great deal, but the, what I've seen has been absolutely fascinating. And I, I'm fascinated by the coaches, aren't you? You know, after the, whatever it is, the basketball team at halftime, they go and they get in a huddle. And you see the coach you know, writing and talking to every one of them. I wish there was a little microphone to hear what the coach had to say. And then I looked at one of those awful boxing matches. They are awful, aren't they? Slugging out. There didn't seem to be any skill at all in it. And then, you know, this poor boy in red goes back to his corner. And the fellow goes, and then whispers into him when the chap's all but blotted out. And you long for a little microphone. What do you think he said? Well, probably it's a good thing there wasn't a microphone in one or two cases. Well, we're going to listen into the microphone this morning. Because our heavenly coach has two things to say. They're very precise. This is all I've got to say to you this morning. You really have to work them out for yourself. But I think I know what some of these things apply, how they apply to me. And I hope you'll work out how they apply to you. So look at the two things that he says. In verse 1... Here's what the coach says. Let us throw everything that hinders, every weight, and the sin that so easily entangles. That's number one. And the second is the third letters. I think in the ESV the letters is laid, left out. But it's let us fix, verse two, fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Now there are the two things. So it's not hidden. We can hear quite plainly what is said. There's something to be thrown off, and there is a duty, a, a delight, but a necessity to fix our eyes on not the girl, but on the Lord himself. Now, let me say quite plainly, you will not complete the course if you do not take the coach's instruction. These are orders. They're practical and they're realistic. And if you don't do it, you're a fool because you won't reach the end. One, the biblical coach says, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that easily entangles. I'm going to suggest there are two things here, not one, though they are very close together. Let us throw off. Uh, I suppose most of us have been thrilled with the swimming. It has been quite astonishing, isn't it? And there's a little shed out of which they come, isn't there? I don't know who thought that up. And out comes this magnificent uh, body, man, and uh, holds up his hands. He's from Germany or wherever, and everybody cheers. Then another magnificent athlete comes out. And then a third, and then a fourth, and then a fifth. And then there's a great chair for the mighty Michael Phelps with those astonishing arms like an albatross, aren't they? Uh, that you feel can go from one side of the swing bar to the other. So what do they do as they come out? Do they start putting on an overcoat uh, and bring in a large suitcase? Now as they come in, they start shedding clothes <laughs> until they're down to the minimum. I suppose it's rather an absurd thought, but I couldn't help feeling this as I walked to church this morning. I wonder how God or your guardian angel sees you coming out of the little hut to swim the race. I mean, in God's sight, are you actually wearing an overcoat with boots on and a large suitcase and a, three paper bags full of stuff? And you can hardly carry them as you go to the edge of the pool. And a man comes up to you and says, shall I just take these off you before you swim? And you say, no, no, I'm going to swim with them. It's easier. <laughs> so 
Yeah, that I suppose, honestly, is how God sees some of us and has seen some of us in past days, weighted down trying to swim the race. Well, I can't say this for you. You know, there are times when the people who listen to a sermon have got to do the work, not the preacher. So I'll mention one or two hindrances, but frankly, they're only guesses. What is holding you back? What are the weights that are dragging you down? Is it a hobby which has now become an obsession? I remember a very fine businessman telling me that after he was converted, after some years, he gave up stamp collecting. He was a very fine stamp collector, but the thing had become an obsession. Filled his diary. Now, there's nothing wrong with stamp collecting. Please don't come up and tell me that uh, that's a very worthy pursuit. But it became a weight. There are commitments to people and committees and so on that ask too much of you. And in the end, you have to prune them or you find them a weight to your Christian life. There are unwise links in relationships, especially with young people. And at school, for example, how many will hear the good news at uh, camps today, like Livington and so on, and then go back next term and find themselves with a, with a, a nice crowd of people, but far from Christian. And while they go around with that crowd, they'll make no progress. In the city, Yes, there was a heavy weight. I spoke on it once and got into a great deal of trouble, but I wasn't ashamed to speak on it, and I spoke on it again, Freemasonry. Freemasonry for a city man is a heavy weight. It will hinder you in your Christian life. Get rid of it. That's my advice. Mistaken ambition. Jobs taken on by kindness that have become too much. There's an Anglican, phobia, uh, an Anglican attitude that was very, very strong in my youth that you ought to go to your parish church, whatever. And so good Christian people would stick at a parish church where there was no hope of any change, any teaching, any fellowship. They'd stay there 10, 20 years thinking that was their duty. Well, it might be that God would call them as Christians to do something, but unless they did it and found that people were listening, they were probably finding a heavy weight holding them back. Well, I can't tell you what it is for you, but even as you sit here, just think if there are any weights that have been holding you back. Sometimes they're very, very subtle. I've been reading about Mrs. Fidget in C.S. Lewis's books, you know, who lived for her family. It was really that Mrs. Fidget needed to be needed, and it became a heavy weight for her and a heavy weight for the family. Ask God then to show you if there are weights and especially ask God to quicken your conscience to see if there is some sin that entangles you and keeps coming back and ask him for deliverance. So will you do this, this very week? Keep in mind those swimmers coming out of the shed. Don't despair. There's not just one winner. We're all winners as long as we take away the hindrances and ask God to take away those easily entangling sins. So that's what the coach is saying. We may not hear the microphone on the television and on the uh, games, but here it is plainly in front of us, isn't it? That's, that's the first great hint uh, to follow. And the second is even more marvelous and much more positive, in a sense, fix your eyes on Jesus. And if you look at chapter 11, 27, uh, there's a very good example of it. By faith, Moses left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger, which must have been very frightening. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. Well, we've got to see him who is invisible. And uh, because he's invisible, I find this is the way to fix my eyes on Jesus. Uh, and by the way, there's no magic in this, and I'm not going to come up with any special thing that you've never heard before. We fix our eyes on Jesus, first of all, in our reading of Scripture. And I always have a gospel on the go. Whatever I'm reading in the Bible, I'm always reading one of the gospels. Now, I know Jesus is at the center of all Scripture, and we can find him everywhere, but nevertheless, I think it's worthwhile steadily reading a chapter a day of a gospel. And there we see Jesus, who's the same yesterday, today, and forever. By the way, I do that in the Old Testament too. You know, I think uh, often 
going through Ezekiel or Jeremiah is very heavy work for most of us. It's probably better to wait till somebody's preaching on it here. Why not do some of the Bible characters? It's a very refreshing way, I think, of learning how to fix our eyes on the Lord because that's what these men and these women did in chapter 11. Why not take one of those characters? I think you'll find it refreshes your own daily Bible reading. So the first way to fix your eyes on the Lord is to look at him, and as he's invisible, to find him in Holy Scripture. But the second way, of course, is in your daily prayers. And for me, Hebrews 4, 14 to 16, is one of the most precious sections in Hebrews, if not of the whole New Testament. Will you turn back to Hebrews 4, 14? I'm going to read from verse 14. I'm sure you know it and love it, but if you don't, I'm going to be a great help to you this morning because I'm going to introduce you to something that has been a help to me and to many Christians all my life and all their lives, I'm sure, too. This is how to fix your eyes on Jesus. Well, he has many roles, doesn't he? Sometimes he's the great king that we look to or the great prophet, and Hebrews has a lot about both of those. But Hebrews revels in Jesus, the great high priest, at the throne of God, ready to welcome sinners and guide them through to the throne. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then, here's the great exhortation, let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Well, have you already approached the throne this morning? You ought to have done. Make sure you do so before the end of the day. For this is the only way to be a spiritual athlete. It's the only way to finish the course. So, have you been drifting? Or are there family friends who've been drifting? Or those you pray for who've been drifting? Have you been hardening the arteries of your heart and beginning to turn away? It's so easy to do. We are sinners. We are rebels. And is it conceivable that there's somebody who was even tempted to throw it all away? Well, get rid of the hindrances. Take off that overcoat and look to the Lord Jesus, your high priest. He will not fail you. So let's pray. Let's come to the throne of grace and to that great high priest so that even this morning we may receive mercy, which we need every day, and grace to help us in our time of need, whatever that need is for you. O Lord Jesus Christ, risen and ascended and enthroned at the right hand of God, we humbly come to that throne of grace, and we ask for mercy, every one of us, lest we be consumed, And we ask for your grace in our times of need. And we ask that we may have uh, the realism and the honesty and the good sense to drop those overcoats that are stopping us from swimming the race. And to fix our eyes on you, Lord Jesus, which is our duty and our delight, so that every one of us may finish the race with joy. We ask it for your name's sake. Amen.